Uh, most of you know me. My name is Lee Freeman. I'm the local historian up in the local history genealogy department uh, during the week. Uh, welcome to the Florence Lauderdale Public Library, our program on uh, Northwest Alabama Earth-like phenomena, which is an interesting program that we've never done anything on this particular topic before. And uh, I'll briefly introduce the speaker in one second, but just a little bit about how this program came to be. I wrote a blog article for the Muscle Shoals National Heritage Area three or four years ago before COVID on historic UFO sightings in the Shoals area, because believe it or not, there have been two or three UFO flaps or outbreaks of sightings in the Shoals area. And one that I wrote about in an article called The Truth Is Out There, I borrowed that tagline from the TV show X-Files, Fox <laughs> Mulder, because I'm a, I'm a big geek as my boss Abby and Sedona and those other guys will attest. So uh, I wrote a blog on historical UFO flaps and the first recorded one that we know about was in 1947 in the wake of the Kenneth Arnold UFO sighting, which kicked off the modern spate of UFO sightings. After his sighting in uh, July of 1940, or June of 1947, everybody was seeing them all over the country. And there were several uh, cases here, if you want to read that blog, it's on their blog site. But a couple of guys uh, from an article, have flying saucers come to the Shoals area? Some think, seem to think so. From the Florence Times of Friday, July 11th, 1947, page one, says, O. McConnell, Culver County Administrative Officer for AAA said that he and J.E. Johnson, a retired railroad man, saw what they think was a flying disc Wednesday morning about 4.30 o'clock, five miles west of Florence on the Waterloo Road while going fishing. The object, which was very bright, Mr. McConnell said, passed in front of the windshield of the car in which the pair was riding at a terrific speed and went out, quote, just like a light, unquote. Mr. McConnell described the object as looking, quote, exactly like a street light that one was looking at about a block away, unquote. He said that he could not determine the distance that it was from the car, but that it was traveling due north. Mr. McConnell added that the, quote, flying saucer, unquote, did not hinder the fishing trip as he and Mr. Johnson returned with a large stream of fish. <laughs> and this article to me, and I've talked about this to Wyatt, we think this sounds like what they may have seen is an earth light or orb or spook light. And if that's what they saw, then this is the earliest recorded case, which I mentioned in that article. Well, a year or two later, I got a phone call from a guy in South Carolina named White Cox said, I read your article. I'd like to talk to you about it. I said, okay, that sounds cool. I've reached my audience of one. <laughs> and so he said, I'm interested in UFO phenomena and other ex unexplained phenomena, but really into earth lights. And I've actually written a book on it. And so he invited me to go out with them, uh, which we did. Me and my friend Phil Gardner went out. We didn't see any that night. We did see some when we went out to Cloverdale, Alabama on October 1st of last year. You can't really see that, but I got that with my cheap flip phone. Uh, Wyatt will show you some video of Dan Erickson's thermal imaging footage, which is a lot more impressive. This is Wyatt's friend Dan, who has all the sophisticated equipment, and he got some really excellent footage of it. But uh, Wyatt Cox is our speaker, and he is a native of Lauderdale County, Alabama. He is a Wilson High School graduate, I'm class of 87, Wyatt was a few years ahead of me. Uh, he went to, Wyatt got his uh, doctorate in divinity degree from Newburgh Theological Seminary just recently. Before that, he worked for several years for the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers. He currently lives in South Carolina. Uh, with his, he has, He's married, he has uh, two grown children and grandchildren. Uh, a couple of times or three times a year, he comes home to visit his parents who live out in the country and usually he'll find time to get in an earth light sighting or earth light excursions to go out and and try to sight them since the late 1970s Wyatt has had an interest in earth light orb phenomena when he and his high school friend greg keaton would go out to cloverdale and sometimes zip city to the old camp florence work prison camp to observe these mysterious lights uh and uh Back in 1980, Wyatt had an article on Earthlights published in Specula, 
the Journal of the Association of Meta Science, which if you're a geek, this is a really cool historic magazine. So it's honored, I'm honored to know somebody that got published in it. And just last year, last September, Wyatt had an article published in the Courier Journal, The Spook Light Legend Lives in our own Lauderdale County Courier Journal. He also is the author of Spook Lights, The Amazing Cloverdale, Alabama Spook Light Mystery, and he has copies for sale. If anybody would like to pick one up, he'll be glad to autograph it. He's already autographed one for one of his former teachers, so no pressure. <laughs> but without taking any more of his time, I'd like to introduce Dr. Wyatt Cox. Is this good? Loud enough, I hope. But, uh, thank, thank you, Lee, and, uh, and to the library folks here. Uh, my first time to do this in, in a library setting is you know, the group of diverse people. So first of all, I want to thank everyone for being out here, I mean, this is, this is, you know, I'm excited about it, and, and I'm very thankful and appreciate all of you being here this morning to see, see what my story is I want to tell. And uh, and then, afterwards, if y'all got a story y'all want to tell, I'm going to hang around. So, and I expect, uh, hopefully some of you do, but I really do appreciate y'all being here for this, this time period, and I appreciate uh, all the library and people, because to do that, it takes a lot of stuff behind the scenes to make it happen. So I'm very grateful to the library. Uh, and for Lee, and I've known him now for a while, and uh, he's come out with us, we hung out together. He's, um, he's had an interest in these things, and it just kind of the relationship has been building. And, uh, and now we're, we're here. And uh, so I want to share with you a little bit of a story here and, and give you some things that probably how I'm going to do it, kind of weave in a lot of things to give you some things to think about. And it's going to be about earth life, and I'll go into a lot of that, but uh, and also um, some ideas on what they might be or not be, um, where to see them, things like that. And then um, with this really, really good group here, um, so afterwards, uh, if you've got any questions or any comments, I'm, I'm going to be here. So you can pull me off to the side, or you can just raise it, like, board it out, whatever, And because I'm here not just to say this stuff, but to learn, because as we learn more, and we are learning more, we're getting a better idea, not only where to see them, but really how to explain what I'm about to talk about. So, again, I'll just start, but I am so thankful that y'all are here for this. Uh, at some point, we'll, we'll show them a video that uh, uh, Dan here, and let me just say just a minute here. I'll recognize some folks. I, I'm really bad. It doesn't matter if I know everybody, I'll leave somebody out. Uh, uh, Greg Keaton, uh, we were buddies at high school, still are. He's been out, me and him, is when it kind of started this back in the day. And I'll talk a little bit about how that got started. Dan Erickson over here, uh, he's, he's the scientist of the group. So if you got any really, really, really technical questions, he'll be the one. Um, can you speak into the microphone? I can speak into the microphone, is that better? Yeah, yeah it's better. That's better, okay. I, I don't know if I need to repeat anything or not. Um, so, um, I mean, I'll talk just a moment or two about the folks here. And I met my former high school librarian uh, a few, just a few minutes ago. And um, I don't know if she's going to tell y'all stories about me or not, but I uh, hope not. But I, I didn't know that. It's great, great for you to be here. And, um, and then Lee said that I finished up whatever he said earlier than him, and that's, that's code for old. <laughs> I'm not as young as I used to be either. That used to be that. And then a, a, a Brent Rains, um, he's a, a subject matter expert on this stuff too. And uh, if you get on the website and go to uh, alternate perceptions mag dot uh, the dot info, well, AP magazine, AP magazine, info. Yes. Yeah, info. Um, he's got I mean tons and tons and tons of stuff on there. And it's uh, and I've known Brent um, more than forty years. So we go back, and uh, he's the guy you go to for a lot of this kind of stuff. He, know, he knows it. So uh, I'll just not spend a lot more time on, on all that because really I'm here kind of. But, again, there's, there's some, a lot of good familiar faces here. And I'll, we'll talk maybe later, but I am so glad y'all are here. Uh, Northwest Earthlight, Alabama. I debated on wearing an actual Alabama hat, but <laughs> there are some Auburn fans I heard. <laughs> <laughs> Don't know. But... Um, I don't want to trip, trip on this either. I'm going to stand right out here because I'm going to explain some of the things uh, in the photos. 
and as we go through this, because some of it's going to need to be explained a little bit. Um, these are actually Earthlight photos that I took. I mean, there's two of them. The blow up. That was a blow up, and uh, that well, that one is too. But that's sort of basically what most of them are going to look like. So let's just go ahead and get started. So my introduction, and I'll, I'll try to not go into too much on that. But the things I want to cover in the introduction will be what are the what are Earthlight? What we call them? Why we call them that? Uh, my story a little bit. I started looking at these lights um, as an older teenager. So a little bit of that, but not a lot. And the description and the characteristics of this, as you see some or you know people that have seen these things, uh, give you an idea of generally how they're described and the characteristics of them. And uh, where they can be observed and general things about observing them. Because there's a lot of places here in the U.S., a lot of places worldwide you can observe these. It's not just here. Uh, but, but some general things, and then I want to get into the, these specifics. And then a little bit of the history of those lights here. And then uh, some selected sightings, and then some parting comments. So that's kind of my introduction. Now, why do we call them earth lights? And call them, there's called a lot of different things. They're called ghost lights, spook lights, um, lantern lights. You remember the old story of the guy gets killed on the railroad tracks, you know, he's holding his lantern, walking up and down the trail, the tracks, looking for whatever he's looking for. And they thought that was what it was. And there are a lot of sightings made associated with railroad tracks. And Greg and I have probably had one of our best ever, and I'll, I'll talk about that, at, associated with railroad tracks. Uh, they're called uh, unexplained or um, um, <coughs> anomalous ph phenomena or something similar to that, that phrase, because it is unexplained. And um, are they called orbs? A lot of people call them orbs and UFOs. And, and I'm, good, I'm cool with that if you call them UFOs. Uh, I don't associate it with the UFO, classical UFO phenomena. That's just me. Um, so what are Earth lights? I'll give you the short answer real quick. I don't really have a lot of answers just yet. <laughs> However, the more I learn from folks like you, the closer I get. And I'm, I think everybody's got a little Sherlock Holmes in them, right? They want to stop, follow a mystery. And this, this is a mystery for me. It has been for quite some time. Now, I want to explain this here. It's not a streak of light that I'm showing. Back in the day, you have a, you use film in your cameras. You remember that, right? Some of you. Okay, some of you remember me. Oh, okay, I remember that. You had film. And, uh, and most film was not good for really, really low lighting outdoor stuff. So with this picture, what it is, it's dark. The camera is on a tripod mounted. And when you push the button, you got a little thing in there. You can screw up a little remote cable, right? I'm thinking ahead now. Okay, there we go. And then you got this cable so long, and you step back from the tripod. And when you see whatever it is you want to see, you push the button. Now the lens opens, but does not close until you let go of the button. So this was open for about, say, 10 seconds. So it captured 10 seconds of this ball moving. And that's what this is. This is 10 seconds, roughly, of a ball of light moving. And it's moving from this way to that way. And this was the spot where Greg and I were first started observing these. Uh, so that's, that's, you'll see some more uh, of these type of uh, photos here in a few moments, but to let you know, that's what that, that is. It's actually a time exposure. And you can learn a lot from time exposures, too. Um, so not sure. I'll talk about maybe what they, a little bit about that, about that. It's, still, it's, it's still unexplained in my mind. Uh, not sure what produces them, but I'm going to give you a couple of theories. Uh, not exactly sure why they're seeing where they are, but there's a good theory I do want to talk about. Uh, it may be easier for me to describe that than define it. Um, so there's multiple suggestions out there as to what they are, but what they're not, and that's important too. Uh, usually, they, and that's actually a blow up of Earth light right there, but um, that's a photo of one out near Cloverdale. And uh, that one was, and, and I'll say this as we go through this, they're two to eight feet in diameter. They're, they're big. Some of them are really, really big. Some are, are like this. I've seen some of the, these, but mainly the, the bigger ones. Uh, two to eight feet in diameter. Uh, they're silent. They don't make any noise. They don't make any noise. Only on two occasions, uh, you, you, know, you, may, you may hear some other background sound or something, but, but it's not part of the arms light. It's really, they are silent or at least the ones I've seen. Uh, they're unaffected by the wind, and this is pretty neat. It's hard to do this with the mic, okay? 
you got a ball of light and it's moving and then it stops and it's windy and the ball of light will just shimmer but it won't move until it decides to move then it goes so they're unaffected by the wind duration a few seconds several minutes talked to one lady um, recently um, she had seen one for like 20 minutes 25 minutes a good long time watching it sit uh, basically above the ground level uh, uh, just a tiny bit uh, west of Cloverdale and um, so they, they could be for a short time or a longer time not hot in other words we've seen them come down look like they crashed or whatever the vegetation is not disturbed they're not hot now uh, some of the ball the light phenomena we like I'll talk about ball lightning is but, but this is not um, so, and they pulsate and they pulsate you can sometimes see the pulsations very very interesting to see that um, maybe near ground level a lot of people see them near ground level sometimes they're they're fairly high up um, colors can vary mainly yellowish orange there's red ones they're white ones occasionally a dark blue one that, that I've seen and others have reported. Two or more can be seen at the same time. And I say this to people who go out with us for the first time. If you see one, first thing you do is turn and look. So you may be seeing another one at the same time. And that does occasionally happen. Uh, you can't see more than one at one time. And I have, and, and there have been others that have too. Um, so they can hover. They don't have to be moving around. They can hover. A lot of times, some people report when they first see the light, it is hovering. Maybe just off the ground or it could be high up but it's just hovering um, maybe a, tra a track a train tra train tracks as you get older you can't think three things other things what three times fast or something you can't do that train tracks uh, Greg and I were uh, if you go out I'll give you the general location if you go out highway 17 toward Wilson right, Wilson's up here the school is down here is, I think, what, road 24, turn right, turn left, turn left, and there's the place that used to be called the, the prison camp, okay, been abandoned. Greg and I used to go out there and was hoping the local deputies would not find out because they weren't supposed to be there, but, but in that, we were at this, uh, on the other side of the track one night, and it was about 10 o'clock, and I was getting ready to leave because we hadn't seen anything, and I, and I'm, the car I parked was about 300 feet away from where we were standing, so I went, like a real smart guy, I went and put my camera up, and Greg stayed back. And uh, you know that's when you have your Kodak moment, right? <laughs> so I go back, put my stuff in the car, I look around, Greg's not there, I go, he's there. I said, well, you know. He said, there's a train coming, you hear the train coming, right? And it was dark and woods, and you could hear the sound, you could hear the, see the light coming through the tree a little bit, you know? And he made a joke, like, let's just stay and watch the train. That way, we can tell people we saw a lot. <laughs> Pretty cool, right? Pretty cool. Look, we're teenagers, right? Come on. And uh, I don't know exactly who saw it first, but here comes the train light piercing the darkness. And, and we look over here, and there's the, the eight-foot light hovering about 20, 25 feet maybe above the tracks. It's hovering there. And it's bright, and you can see... The track you can see, you know, so clearly, and so you get a good estimate of how big the ball of light is because you see the spacing of the tracks, right? And here comes the train, the light is still there. Here comes the train, you know, uh -oh. here, you know, and in the part of the train that has the diesel engine that turns the generator, when it got here, it went like that. They both went together. They they electrically locked together. And they just went till we just couldn't see it anymore. And we kept thinking, oh, wow, that'll be in the paper tomorrow. How do you, you know, nothing, nothing was. But uh, it was, that was one of our better signs. And now other people here are here are in this area have reported. And, uh, and, and if you go to other places in the U.S., there's a other connection, it seems to be, with that kind of metal, the railroad tracks. And, and so there seems to be a connection. And I will mention that, too. Uh, electrical energy. One time a guy came to me, and I knew him from way back here in this area. Uh, he said, you know where we used to go fishing at as a boy? I go, yeah. You know where that big field is? Yeah. You know where the power line is? Yeah. 
You know, I was 14 years old. And I hadn't told anybody, but you know, I'm, I'm walking home from the creek. I come to the power line and I look up and there was a, like the eight foot big ball of light. Not connected to the power line, but, but three or four or five feet away from it at that level. He said, I'm watching it for several seconds. And then it just kind of moves and moves and then just goes away. So there may be a connection with that. Could be. Suddenly appears like turning a light switch on or off. Sometimes they fade out instead. Sometimes they'll they'll spiral. Sometimes they will. Um, and a lot of them use the same path, which means if you find where you see two or three over a period of time, that's that's probably their their if they travel a certain way, that's probably a, their path. And there are probably others there as well. Um, my story, and I won't spend much time on it. Remember 1973? Some of us don't, but um, there was a big UFO flap that they saw in the area. Every day, newspapers are reporting UFOs in the area. And I believe a lot of them were Earthline sighting. And I'll tell you why. Yeah, in Lexington. Lexington was the epicenter of it. And almost daily, the newspapers here had stuff in there. And I've got most of those articles in my file. Um, so it happened. Flying uh, Saucer. That's Lexington. There we go. Over Lexington. Uh, 19, and that would be what? 1973, 50, 50 years uh, ago. Now, this is interesting here. If I can bring this out, I've got my, my laser. Yeah, the, the uh -oh. depression at the middle of the top. All right. Oh, the, okay. I just got to follow directions. Is that it? The button at the middle of the top. You may have to. It's the other middle one. The other middle one, yeah. <laughs> okay, that's, that's it. So here is, uh, this was Raleigh Nix, and I spoke to Raleigh Nix a few years after this, and he gave the same story. He goes outside, him and some other adults and children, and there's a field next to, or next to, adjacent to his property, and he sees this eight foot ball of light just sitting there at ground level for several seconds. Then it starts moving, and then it just goes. And that's one of the things that started some of this, is people seeing what Raleigh Nix said he saw. And that was 50 years ago. So in 1976, a, 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 a high school a friend there said that his mom sees these strange lines when she washes dishes. So that's why y'all don't see dishes, well, strange lines anymore, right? Y'all don't see dishes like that. <laughs> And the one that laugh connect with that and they resonate with that. Uh, but you look out her window and see this, this big ball of light come. And uh, so her son told me about it and was like, I'll oh, come on. And uh, we went. And we began watching those balls of light. And that's kind of how it got started for us. And then we went to different locations, trying to figure out better locations. Uh, other people began telling some of their stories. and. Uh, one thing led to another, led to another. So for several years, this was this was our thing. And um, so this is it. And that's actually a photo of the place we first went to as teenagers. And again, this is a, a time exposure of about five or six seconds. So the lens is open for five or six seconds. It catches that ball of light moving that distance. And then from that time exposure, you can estimate the speed and different things like that. But that was um, one of the earlier ones that we actually did see, and it was, um, um, if you go to Wilson High School, drop down, you know, you can turn right, and you go out there, and I won't give exact her name or location, but it's not far from there, and that's where that, that picture was taken. Uh, and that's the same light now moving away. That was pretty exciting, I mean, seeing those things like that. And in 19, you know, this was 1977, 78, um, and remember, 73 with the big flag. Everybody's talking about UFO. But they, they, you know, but this was UFO. If it was strange and in the air, it was UFO. Um, and now this one's interesting. I took this in a different place. It's time exposure. It's several seconds long. But if you notice, uh, the way I, I looked at this here is, if you notice that the, the light, it comes all the way back down to here. Well, it was near the ground at first. And you could see it moving. 
upward. And a lot of times you'll see, a lot of times, but several have been reported, you know, at ground level. Uh, that's the one that's blow up. It's not the best. I thought I'd put that in there. I took that one, I guess, late last year. That one? Yeah, late, late de December last year. And, uh, and that's why if you take, try to take a still picture of one moving, and then it's black out, it's dark outside and all that, but the camera, uh, and that's what a lot of them will look like. Um, now, I'm off to the left. They didn't put me in the picture. They got, they got Greg in there. Yeah, that's, that's, yeah, I'm up here doing the talk, right? Um, but it, this just to give you a little bit of my background on how, we, how long we've been interested in this. So this turned out, and um, I had a hair back then, too. But, um, but that was uh, back in 81, January of 81. That tells you, you know. And then years later, a few years later, they run another article similar to that one, I guess. And then back in September, at least, they had uh, they, a local weekly paper carried the article. So that's my, my story. Um, why are flights or not? They're not UFOs. I don't, I don't go in that direction, even though there's some strange things about them. Uh, they're not airplanes. You know, people think about airplanes, helicopters. No, they're, they're not. Um, so I don't believe they're a solid object. It's not supernatural, that's why they call them ghost lights, right? In my book, what is it? Ghost lights, spook lights, everything. And so they're supernatural, but I don't believe it is. Uh, not ball lightning. But so I'm not doing UFOs, so these earth lights are not UFOs. See, they actually do get cut on tape. <laughs> <laughs> but they're not UFOs. They're not supernatural. They're not, you know, the guy got killed at the train and he got his lantern light looking for something. Whatever it is, they're not. It's not. I don't believe it. Uh, they're not a solid object. They're not a plane. Now, I want to show this picture. There's the light, right? The, 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 the time exposure opens say about 30 seconds. The lens it captures 30 seconds of movement. There's the Earth light, and there's the plane. You tell the difference. Pretty easy. Real easy. There's the plane just being a plane. It's different. With a time exposure, this is the stuff you can get that helps me, at least, understanding some things. There's another one. It may have been the same one, a different position, or maybe a different earth light, but it's, uh, it's out towards um, 157, right near Cloverdale area. Uh, um, east and west of there seems to be a real hot spot, and I'll tell you here a little bit why. It's not ball lightning. Now, let me tell you a little bit about ball lightning. Some people say, what is ball lightning? And it shouldn't be that unknown really and I'll tell you why. That is ball of lightning right there. And it's a ball of light. It looks like an earth light sort of. It doesn't behave exactly like an earth light. And it's hot or like an earth light. A ball of lightning is usually produced with intense electrical storms and maybe in association with electrical power lines. Don't have to be. Uh, but it usually comes from uh, the electrical storms with a lot of energy they, they energize and charge a pocket of air. Well, a fair amount of energy, it seems like. And, and they, it's free-floating. Here's the actual uh, a video of ball lightning. And that's what it looks like. Okay, that's, that, that's actual what it would look like. Uh, ball lightning has been seen in Florence more than twice that I know of, uh, three times that I know of. There's one several years ago, uh, um, I can't see the date, 1976. Reported here, Florence, ball lightning. Later, another sighting occurs. And I, I talked with the guy who saw ball lightning uh, just barely east of Cloverdale a few years ago. Uh, and it was, the way he described it, it would have been ball lightning. So it is, it, there is ball lightning around here on, on occasion, but it's not earth lights. Not in my mind. So it's how do I explain it? That's the tough part. I used, and I make this as a joke, sort of, and I'm, I'm going to embarrass Dan over here. He's a scientist. Until I met a scientist, I was thinking I was getting it figured out. <laughs> and then, then I realized I didn't. Uh, but I did realize I'm getting close to asking the right questions. So that's good. So how do I explain it? Uh, there are books out there that's tried to. They, they're earthwise and they connect it with UFO uh, in their own way and a lot of people did. Uh, they're, they're explaining the earth light theory. There's a lot of books out there that's trying to explain it. Uh, but how do we do that? Why do we make that the, another earth light that was seen uh, blow up, obviously, for me, but it was near um, Cloverdale, 
cry off of 157. Uh, and that's kind of what they look like. Uh, theory number one. And I'll tell you about theory number one. This area here uh, has some actually unique geological qualities, I think, a lot of unique. Uh, so the balls of this pulsating light form by underground electrical currents, is that what it is? It can be seen above ground level, that's the that's theory. That's the theory it's out there, it's, great. it's gained some traction. Uh, these orbs are a ball of electrically charged, or a mix of, there's sulfur in the area here, you know, everybody knows there's sulfur water, and methane as well, and when they mix, there's some electrical properties with that, and air, is that what it is? And that's what some people believe it is. Uh, the unique, the uniqueness of this area, there's other places in the world that's got this uniqueness. One is there's a lot of quartz and iron here. There's a lot in the ground. There's a lot of water near the surface and down deep. There's sulfur. I would imagine most of us have had sulfur water. Right? Um, methane gas and a stable but active geological fault. And it runs east to west here, up and it goes from this now part of Mississippi, probably past Huntsville. Uh, the, the, the bedrock is a geological fault that runs really where we go to Cloverdale. There's a geological fault there. It's stable, but occasionally you see in the paper, you know, the earth tremor of 1.1, and you don't even feel it, right? But, it's, but it is active. So what does that mean? What about the quartz and the iron? Some of you older people, myself included, do you ever remember a quartz radio? Not many, not many people shaking their heads. Okay. <laughs> okay. I remember one. You had to have a piece of quartz to make it work. A crystal. It had to do with the, the electricity flow. You had to have it. If you put pressure on quartz and you take the pressure off, that's what you'll find in some of your lighters nowadays. It makes an electric spark. So if you got a stable of an active geological fault, put pressure on the quartz with the iron ore, with the water, with the sulfuric acid, and what kind of acid is in your car battery? Sulfuric acid. So you get a bit of voltage there. Uh, you got those right ingredients. Um, I did this little experiment out there, and uh, yeah, I made a little battery. You can do that, make a little battery cell. Get your little plastic container in your zinc and your copper in your voltmeter and you get about five times the reading of the local sulfur water than you do the non-sulfur water up there so a little bit of voltage that's from the surface down deeper don't know don't take much voltage to push the electrical current if you ever get a, a magnet of a kid wrap an insulated wire around it you know and then put a battery to it you got a magnet right that's the idea. And now this book, Tom Bearden, years ago published I knew Tom, I, I, I think he was a great scientist, a great genius, really, in my mind. He wrote this book, and he tried to explain in this book from a science perspective, Earthline. And it was, he did a lot of other things in the book, but he tried to explain this. And what he did is about railroad tracks. When you got the current from that geological fault being produced, going to stay this way, and the train tracks are this way. You're going to have a magnetic field on those tracks. That's his theory. Whether it's true, uh, there's a lot of people that kind of buy into that. And so what happens is you've got a field, and this is half a field. It's all it's, it's circular part of underground. Over here is underground, and then you've got a secondary field, and this is his theory, that's outside of this that loops everything over. And then in the middle of that, way the electrical magnetic field would work, in his mind, in the middle of that, a, a, another magnetic field is produced that is also round, and it can charge pockets of air. If that the theory is correct, then that, that is your earth line. That was his theory. And he, in his book, Excalibur Briefing, he actually, that's kind of like what you'd see out near Cloverdale. That's in New Jersey. He, he used that as a reference in his book, and there's other places uh, all, all over the world where you can see Earth life sort of like what we see. Um, the other theory is they're kind of like the big amoeba, you know, the, the little microscopic thing, you know, uh, amoeba you learn about in high school or college or whatever, and uh, 
And that could be like a, a big amoeba thing, amoeba thing, you know. Um, it kind of, you know, alive. And just kind of floating around doing its thing. Uh, that would be an amoeba there, and yeah, that was his theory. It, it hadn't gained a lot of attraction. But that, that's one of the theories that had floated around for a while. Um, other theories are out there, some more I call fanciful or esoteric or whatever. And, and right now, I, if people ask me of all the theories which one you'd believe, if you know me well, my answer is always the same. It, it depends on what day of the week you ask me. <laughs> because as I learn more, I'm being forced to reevaluate some of my assumptions. And I guess that's natural to do. Worldwide, it's mainstream too. You know, people say, I've never heard of that. Well, that's true. It's not, most people don't go around talking about it either. They don't. They don't. But it's actually a worldwide phenomenon, and it's really mainstream now. A lot of people, you know, years, a few years ago, well, they with UFOs. Now it's not. Now it's really a mainstream. Like, this is, this is something scientists ought to be looking at. Yes, it is mainstream. I don't know if any of you have got little bitty kids or little bitty grandkids, but you know about Mater. <laughs> Mater the truck, it gets in all kinds of adventures and mischief. And look what his episode is. The ghost life. Mainstream. Right. It's mainstream. Uh, back in 1955, the oldest booklet I can find that was dealing with it. Again, look at the look at the description of it. About what we see out there. Uh, Texas, Marfa, Texas, uh, well known for uh, a lot of anomalous lights, earth lights. Uh, Gordon, Arkansas. I got to tell you a little story about this. And you know, but look at the look at the artist description of it. It's, it's what we see. But I got to tell you a little story about this. A little while back, and I won't go into a lot of details, but um, I'm, I'm a person who who had the classic case of the the widower meeting the widow, right? Get married. That, that was me. And the counselor, I got to know that counselor. I got to know really well. An older guy is. Well, he was, you know, take 10 years older than me. Great, great guy, great guy. And early on, I told him about my interest in earth life. He didn't say anything. Oh, that's interesting, that's cool, whatever. Several months later, I'm talking with him. He said, well, let me tell you something. You, you like earth life and stuff. I said, yeah. He said, I've seen one. He broke down and said he's seen one. He saw it in Gordon, Arkansas. He said, years ago, we was traveling through uh, the country with friends, and we heard about these lights, and, and he said, uh, let's just go, to, go there at the tracks where they're seen and see if we can see one. He said, so we did. He said, I'm standing on the tracks. It's dark. Trees on both sides. Just, you know, cut the, the rail, there's a railroad track going through the forest. And he said, there it is. It was about three-foot diameter, and it's just hovering about four feet off the ground right above the track. And he said, it's the light. And then it started, he said, it starts coming toward them. And it gets closer and closer and closer. Then it said it just makes a 90 degree turn into the woods and then it's gone. And that was in Gordon. Now, now Brandon, I'm gonna pique your interest here. Just recently now, I gotta go and go forward in time. I met a pastor uh, in, in South Carolina, got to know him, and we were out at lunch about two weeks ago. And I was talking and I told about my strange hobby. And he said, well, I've seen one in Chapel Hill, Tennessee. Yeah, I wrote an article in Specular about yeah, Chapel Yeah, Hill. Chapel Hill, Tennessee. Wow. And he, his was two and a half feet in diameter. He saw it that well. He saw it extraordinarily well. At night, there was the tracks, the whole thing. So people see these things. They really do. Uh, North Carolina has coastlines, right? Brown Mountain is real famous for that. And what I did, I did this by accident. I had a U.S. map laying out, and I don't know what this means. I don't know if it means anything. I'm going to tell you, but I don't know what it means. Laying the map out, I think Marfa, Texas. If I get a straight edge and draw a line from Marfa, Texas to Brown Mountain, North Carolina, where these earth lights are seen, I cross over to Gordon, Arkansas, and I cross over Cloverdale, Alabama, and go straight, and I go to Brown Mountain. I don't know what that means. But that's the whole thing about some of this. You get all this data, and what does it mean? I don't know. Uh, a lot of books are out. A lot of books are out about this stuff. Um, Thirdly, uh, you know, I got that copy. Um, I got that copy. And Hef Dalen, Norway, in my mind, that's in Norway. They had a 
probably exactly or almost exactly what we've got at Cloverdale area. What they report, what they see is just extraordinarily similar. Uh, but that's in Hessendale in Norway. The men men lights, look at, look at what it looks like, like what we see. That's in Australia. Uh, the men men lights. Uh, 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 illuminating the darkness, the mystery of the, of the spook lights by Dale Kazmarek. And he's coming next month down here to meet with me and some other guys he's bringing. And we're going to try to have several people assemble and, and we're going to look for some, look for some lights. And uh, hopefully we'll get some, some good documentation on that. Uh, there was my book I did, and, and, and I was hoping, and I'll be honest with you, when I wrote it, I, I, was, I was living in South Carolina, and I was trying to do the earth thing. I thought, I've got to get closure on this. How do you get closure on something? You do something big, right? Write a book. Well, that only piqued my interest more, so I didn't do it. Um, I actually took, that's the picture I took. That actually is a picture of a white earth line, by the way, that I took that. And um, so, uh, brief history of Northwest Earth Lot phenomenon. And um, 1930, as far as far back I can go in newspaper articles, of, of a woman and her three of her grandkids, I believe it was three of them, but near Cloverdale, not, not Cloverdale, near Waterloo, near Waterloo, which is straight from Cloverdale, basically. She um, saw a three foot, it was kind of like a Gordon Arkansas picture of the guy in the car and the, and the it was kind of like that. The light approached their car at night. They were, they were going to school. Not, about 1930, not a lot of people had cars. She did. And they were near the school, and this light appears. Kind of like that one in that picture of Gordon. Um, and it went around the car it was that low to the ground. It said it lit up inside the car. And it just kind of went away. 1930. And, this, and I think Lee Freeman talked about this. Yeah, I'm sorry. I didn't know you were going to use this. Oh, so I, I'm fine. This is, I'm, I'm glad you brought it up because this is a historical thing here. And I won't go into it because uh, he already talked about 1947. There's a the report uh, of the Shoals area. And if you read into it, I, for me, I could, I could make it out like they came like with an earth. But that was me. Um, 1969, I talked with this lady. And she showed me and some others where she and her brother had seen uh, in the Cloverdale area in 1969 the big orange eight-footers in a field. And watched one of them for several minutes. And thought, at first, just thought the grass was on fire. Right? I mean, it's 1969, the teenager. What do you expect? You know, thought the grass was on fire. And they looking at it, they're watching it, watching it. And then they realize, no, it's just a ball of light. And they saw, saw this ball of light on two different occasions. And uh, she was gracious enough to show us some, uh, some of, of us the location, gave the story. It was really incredible, incredible story. Um, also, uh, Moving up forward in time, 1973. Uh, I, I'm, I'm hesitant to show this because I don't want people to go to dump to look for earth lights. But people did. People did. The garbage dump UFO. But a lot of people were showing up. And if they, if you, if they describe the, the, a lot of what they saw, it was, to me, an earth lot. Mystery sightings back again. It's 1973. They're back again. People are seeing. Um, there's one. Um, and, and it's probably one of the earlier pictures of, the, of an earth light uh, in this area. Um, it said, the, the down here, it said the object started moving before we could get the any closer look. It probably was hovering. What date is that? That would have been 1973, I'm okay. thinking March. The date's not on there. I think I wrote it at the bottom or whatever, maybe up at the top, but I believe that's March 73. Uh, in April, a couple of frat brothers, and if you look at this, you know, where are the lights that an airplane would have? You know, that might caught my attention. They're not, though. So I way it's described, probably an earth light, as far as I'm concerned. Um, there we go back to again, March, uh, the, the landfill. I mean, people were going like crazy out there, hundreds of people at, at, at on the weekend nights to get a glimpse of this, this light. It was a big, big thing. Um, the Aerial Phenomena Research, Research Organization, they, they keep a, if you submit your observation or your claim to them, they, they document it, they put it in their database, and you look at their database, it, they got it for the public, and, uh, and then um, a ball of light went into the water. Don't know. What did I make of that? I don't know. Ball of light. 
go then, come thou, but it's a bottle of wine. Um, Bill Rogers, a uh, young uh, college person at the time, doing some research on this, but this is what caught my attention. This is what caught the object cited appeared to be silvery, not orangish as many previous objects cited. And that caught my attention because the orange ones, in my mind, not with blinking lights and flashing lights, just the orange ones. To me, that would have been an earth line. So that, caught, that sentence caught my mind. That was then in October of 73. So moving up. And in 74 or 75, this guy, uh, Stanley Ingram and his friend, uh, published a book. It's out of print, unfortunately, but uh, in this book, and I did this one for, for Brent. Brent, you're Tennessee. I'm sorry, we got a Tennessee guy in here. But he's from Tennessee. And uh, uh, a few miles from over into Tennessee, uh, Giles, Giles County, I guess, yeah. Um, there's um, back in uh, 73, uh, a person uh, reports this in daylight, daytime, this kind of a white uh, this orb that he sees. Very strange. And there's another time exposure I took of that of that place I originally would go to back in the 70s and early early 80s, and that's uh, so about a 30 second time exposure showing, showing that ball of light 30 seconds. Uh, another now keep going, and you see here that's an airplane. That's an airplane, easy to spot. Uh, one, I said, one is a different spot in the uh, position than the other photo I showed. It's just kind of moving around. Um, just floating around, but um, and then that's a, that's a different one there, but it's in a similar place. But that's a different one, and I and I took that picture as well. That one's probably about three years old, I guess. So um, a little bit of the history. That's a blow up, obviously, method. But that's again, if you, that's what you see, and if you look at some of the pictures in those book covers I showed, that's what you see. That's what you got. I'm hesitant to bring this up. You say this is not part of Earth lights. I don't know if it is. You want me to tell a story? Yeah, why not? Why not? <laughs> I like putting people on the spot. <laughs> Dan and I were out there. I won't give the specifics. Uh, we were at the place. I'm looking one way. He's looking the other. And he yelled at me to turn and look. And, and what we see, what we see, I've never seen it before. It was a rectangle, white light. It was a rectangle. And it was bright. And I mean really bright. And it would kind of like this. It would be bright and the light go out. But when it came back on, the light would be here. Go out, come back on, be here. And it did that. Then it went out and the light was here. And then, and then until you couldn't see it anymore. Went down behind the trees. And Dan probably wouldn't tell this story. So I'll go ahead and tell it myself because it, it embarrasses me. <laughs> If you're gonna get embarrassed, do it yourself. Let's keep it, keep it down. But um, I got frustrated because I was out there looking for Earth life, and I made some comment about the UFO. Anybody can see a UFO. <laughs> and uh, I was, I was, I was frustrated. I was Dan to see a good Earth life. And, 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 and but this, why I put this picture here? Why? And this is the critical thing, critical thing for me. Is about two weeks after that sighting, I'm at home. I'm looking on YouTube for uh, Earth Life stuff, and Heff Dalen, I mentioned that place. There was a, a documentary, been out a few years, but I hadn't seen it, so I started watching it. And about nine minutes and 36 seconds, or about 30 seconds into the video, they're interviewing this guy in Norway. The Norwegian, but you got, I guess, you know, but he's describing this thing he saw. And the artist's rendition of it is that. And that's very, very, very close to what Dan and I saw there. So if has Dalen Earth light phenomena includes that, then it looks like it's included in Cloverdale too. And I say this for a number of reasons. A lot of the Earth lights are round balls of light. There's some that may be elongated, right? Some are maybe different color. Maybe some there's some things that just a little different about. Um, so I, I, and I will say this about the earth lights. And that's, that's a photo of, of one of the lights, the white ones. And I was with a guy one time and uh, he was out at night. He had this really expensive equipment. I mean, expensive stuff. And I was like, wow. 
And um, he had this big old tripod. It takes two of us to get the tripod out of his vehicle. It's that kind of stuff. And he had all these cameras on it, all this stuff. And I, and I asked him, I said, if I was to get all this stuff on that tripod, including the tripod, how much would that cost? And this guy's a guy who makes documentaries professionally all over the world. He said, oh, about 100000 He got his night vision camera on. As dark as can be. He gets a message on it saying, excessive background light. The camera shuts down. Don't know, can't figure it out. Turn it on again. Excessive background light shuts down. He said, I've been all over the world videoing at night. He said, that's never happened before. I've never had that happen. And, um, and then his other camera there, just been charged. He keeps them warm, you know, because it's cold. We'll go out sometimes when it's really cold. He puts the battery in the camera, and then after a few minutes, the camera shuts down because of a low battery. He said, How that? I mean, this camera, this battery ought to be good for two hours. It's 15, 20 minutes later, it's, you know. He puts another battery in, same thing. And he said, I've been all over the world. I've never had that happen. So there's some kind of electrical thing going on, probably. That's why there's some electrical energy involved. Um, so parting comments, because I want to show a video here in a moment, too. And I'd like if Dan would, or, or and Brian, whoever wants to play some stuff, by all means, this is my time, time to do it. Um, parting comments that I want to part with. Um, I want you to go out and look through these if you want to. I encourage you to. Because I, um, well, my mom, she wasn't going to come, but wasn't able to at the last minute. But she called me two, two or three nights ago and was telling me some folks she knew had been talking to them, they've been reporting their, their life fightings, right? And um, so I encourage people to do it, to get out and look. And we look, uh, the winter time has usually been better for me. Uh, more sightings, really good sightings. Summer's been good with some, some really good sightings, but not seemingly as many. Winter time is good. This is a good time of the year to do it, if you can stand the cold and all that. But I um, encourage people to do it. You can contact me. I'd love to hear about your stories or at or, 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 Hear your questions. And uh, I always end with this last thing. I probably don't even have to. Most of the land out there is not public land. Just be sure you get a report with the landowner. You're going to be tromping around in the fields or yards and stuff. You know, clear that with the owner first. Because a lot of them are real friendly. And that's my phone. <laughs> I was going to say everybody turned the phone off. But uh, I didn't. And I... Mm. Okay. This is... Uh, and I get older, I got more of these awkward moments. <laughs> It'll probably rain again. Okay. okay. So, the last thing y'all know when y'all go out, the, the phone ringing. And, uh, but, uh, but, but anyway, <coughs> I encourage y'all to look and report that. Like I say, uh, to me, or, uh, I'd be glad to give you my number and other contact information. But, uh, and because it's important for me, when you say I've seen one, where did you see it? What did you see? When did you see it? And we're trying to get more of that correlation data, you know, where we can actually make more sense out of it. Because if we can find a better place to go to, that's even better. And for some people have sightings, I mean, some people have sightings that are very low on the ground, you know, and um, somewhere, you know, up there. And, uh, and I really believe that um, some of these do start out near the ground. Uh, and then they, they move up to a, a preferred elevation. But there's a lot of variation in that. So, um, want to show the video? Want to show a video. Um, and Lee can tell you a little bit about it. He was there. Well, Dan took it. So Dan took it. Dan, would you like to come up and, sure. and um, tell us whatever? He's a, Dan Erickson is actually the, the scientist guy that comes out. He, when it comes to science, the guy is, is, is brilliant. He really has. He's been a tremendous, tremendous. I've got the sound turned off, so Dan, I can oh, turn the sound off. You might, not, you can narrate through. Yeah, that. just leave the sound out. So what we uh, had noticed, we've been out there probably an hour or two. Um, I think it's seven fifty-two in the evening. Yeah, about that. October first of last year. Right, and uh, what we had noticed is is this bright object. It's a little brighter than a star. And at first I thought, well, we're witnessing, you know, Venus or something. And, uh, but it, it had appeared uh, kind of just instantaneously and it's hovering 
so you know I'm thinking okay it's a star but we'll, I'll track it and it slowly rises it'll slowly and just very this is eight minutes long so we got it for a long time usually a sighting is just a few seconds you, you barely even have a chance to point it out and what you'll notice is this halo that's around it which is an artifact of the night vision so it's taking ambient light and then augmenting it now it, it's not necessarily doing it for the stars and this has an additional halo on it so it's it's bigger than the other objects that are out there and it's also pulsating a little bit and you'll see that uh, exaggerated but one of the things we know it's not an airplane. Out there you can hear very well. I mean, we can hear the traffic a couple of miles away. An airplane, just a single, you know, just like a Cessna or something, you can hear that engine. A jet, I mean, barely on the horizon we can hear it. And a jet has a contrail in the back of it and a big strobe. And this is gonna augment any light and a, an airplane has this, I mean, it's a bright flash. It's so obvious that it's an airplane. But in this case, we're not hearing anything. We're not seeing any strobes. Yeah, it's pulsating a little bit, but it's not twinkling like a star. And it is coming towards us. Um, now, there's, there's kind of a a phenomenon that happens when you're using this camera. It's, it's uh, just the cell phone uh, in front uh, or, or recording what's on the night vision, which is a, this is a, a Gen 3 tactical, uh, this, this is a military grade um, night vision goggles. And the cell phone is just on, on video. It's just a regular cell phone, 12K, uh, and it's just looking through one of the eyepieces. Now with the other one, we're holding it. I mean, it's, it's kind of heavy. And as you're going up, uh, you know, at about six minutes in here, I'm, a, I'm getting a little tired of holding this thing. <laughs> and uh, I hand it off to Brent because he's, he's standing there next to me. And, and uh, Brent gets it right about now. We're, we're kind of just ha trying to hand it off and not shake it too much. And, uh, and, and, he's, and you can see it's kind of picking up speed now because it was low on the horizon and now it's, it's up about here. Now, there's something called UFO neck. And after you've, you've been <laughs> like this, you get a little, a little dizzy and, and you get a little crick in your neck. And so um, uh, you'll notice uh, Brent is a good photographer, by the way, but uh, he, he starts to get the UFO neck. <laughs> and he's about here, and you'll see it spin around. Now there's a, another little thing. You'll see some, uh, something tracing through, uh, and those are bats. So if you slow it down, you can actually see them, you see the wings. So the definition is there. I mean, this is not fuzzy, okay? We can tell the difference between a butterfly, a bat. I mean, this is pretty high resolution. And now it's almost straight up. And this is as close as it gets. And you'll see a pulse right there. Right? So, you know, when, for me, you know, my heart's sinking <laughs> because the only thing that I think of that pulses is an airplane or a jet. So I'm thinking, oh, well, you know, we've, we've just captured a, a jet and, and, you know, this is, this is a non-event. The, the thing is, is there's no, there's no heat trail there's no contrail coming out the back. We're listening, and this is maybe 
Maybe this is, is it like 5,000 feet above us? See, there, there's, there's, there's Brent doing the, the turn. <laughs> And he's probably like, thank God, I get to <laughs> put my head down. But there's one of the other things about this type of phenomena is it seems to be directional. So some people, like, there, there's been an event where we've seen an orb, somebody looking straight at it can see it and someone standing 90 degrees off of it can't see it. So it changes its, its optically changes with the direction of how you see it. Um, I don't know what it is. So it, it, it's, it, it acts like uh, what Wyatt has typically talked about as an orb. Most UFO, 80% of all UFO sightings start like that. And then it turns into something else when it gets closer or somebody yeah, starts to identify really it. Now. But usually they'll say, we saw an orb and then it became, it went into something else. Yeah. But I, I've looked at this and it's, <laughs> it's not a regular pulse. And when, <laughs> I wish I had another uh, uh, video to show you what, what a jet looks like. But I mean, it's tr 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 I, it, 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 it's regular and, and very, very uh, definite that it's, it's a jet. And also the two lights on the either end of the mm -hmm. wing tips show up very, very pronounced. Yeah, we heard no noise at all. I mean, there was no engine noise for the whole eight minutes or so we watched it. And I wouldn't have believed it either, but I was there and I saw it, so. <laughs> and I, I got a, a fuzzy picture with my cheap flip phone of it, so. But his image no. is really impressive. Yeah, I did get to look at it with binoculars while Brent was, was kind enough to video it. And what I saw were, were, were two uh, light objects right next to each other. So it, it wasn't just a single. Well, let, me, let me add. <coughs> I, may, I may add. I may add to it. I don't know. There have been in the past, and I, and I can probably show the, the photo. If you're watching the Earth fly, the big one, and then when you look at the photo or whatever you got, maybe even more quality, you'll see sometimes a smaller <coughs> Earth fly either following it or it connected to it. So, so there's part of the mystery again. It's, it's not just a object sometimes, and, and there's a lot of variations in this. And one of the things I didn't say is one of our, one of my better sightings. I think I was by myself. Well, I think I was by myself on this, and um, I'm looking toward the west where I would a lot of times see an Earth light one comes out. It's a big one, you know, comes out, and I look. The other way to the east, so you always try to look, and there's another one at the same size, same elevation. This was going this way. This was going this way. And I don't know when they got together, did they merge, or just one got behind the other, but then it, they stopped for several, several seconds. And then I don't know if the one that was going this way decided to go back. And the other one that go back, or did the other one just continue to go that way? And you know, I don't know. So there's sometimes with these lights, I, I really do believe on occasion there, there's not just one there. Uh, why? 